Hello, regular Drews. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our special episode number 10. We're going to be talking about Nancy Drew Detective, the 1938 movie starring Benita Granville. Well, aren't you a regular Nancy Drew? We sure hope so. And we hope you are, too. Join us as we talk Nancy Drew cover to cover and click to click. Welcome to Regular Nancy Drew. So do we want to start off with three words? Old timing? No. Yeah. Old, old Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess we could say Lark's Berlane. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Gosh, radio? You want to say radio? radio? Yeah, that works. Because that's a that's a little bit of a plot point, and also it just feels very radio. I know mm -hmm. it's it's because of the old movie thing mm -hmm. and the way that they talk. They just all talk like they're radio hosts, mm -hmm. <laughs> like from the nineteen forties. <laughs> Ned especially, or sorry, Ted, Ted, Ted. especially. <laughs> I was surprised how much I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. I didn't expect to like it as much as I did. I really liked it. <laughs> I thought that they were really entertaining and really cute and like overall definitely worth a watch. Like I have some opinions about, of course I have some opinions about yes. Nancy <laughs> and characterization and all of that. But like overall, I feel like this is probably a solid adaption, especially oh, yeah. considering that it was done in, you know, the 1930s. So I think it was pretty good. I'm so happy we got the Larks for Lane movie, just like I, I wanted. I know. I can't believe we said that. And turns out, turns it's out. The first ever movie they made about <laughs> Nancy Drew, they made it about Larks for Lane. Everybody else recognized just how great that book is. And is like, <laughs> yep, exactly. We are. That's exactly what we're going to do. <laughs> I think they did it justice as well. I think if we were 12 year olds going to see this movie in 1938, I think we would have absolutely loved it. Totally, totally. And you know, what would be so cool now is just thinking about this. You know, they do like remakes all the dang time. They should remake the movie. They should remake Nancy Drew Detective. Yeah. With, you know, as Lark's Berlane, Password to Lark's Berlane, and just revamp that. Mm -hmm. That's popular. We should do that. Let's do it. <laughs> Oh, okay. Benita's not still alive, is she? No, she's no. not. She died in the 80s, I, I think. It oh, was wow. 88. Longer ago than I thought. Yeah. That's sad. Yeah. Sorry, Benita. You were you were an excellent Nancy. Well, <laughs> no, 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 no. I liked, I definitely liked Benita Granville. I thought that she, her expressions were like on point. Oh, like yes. Her, uh, like her facial expressions. So a lot of, especially, so I also watched the second one. I watched Nancy Drew Reporter as well as Nancy Drew Detective and her facial expressions in that there's just moments where like, she has like this, uh, like, oh, what's the right word to describe the face? Like she know like she knows something that like other people don't see or like, she's like, she's suspicious about something. Okay. The face she makes when she's suspicious. That's what it is. It's like, uh -huh. ooh, it, it looks it just like I imagine Nancy's face would look when she's like investigating something. Yeah. Um, so overall, yes, I think she did a fantastic job. Mm -hmm. And this is Nancy before any of the revisions right. ever even got started. This is 20 years before they started revising any of the books. So this is, you know, original Nancy Drew that it's based off of. So interesting to see how they portrayed it at the time when she very first got popular. Yeah, totally, totally. I mean, I think that was probably the biggest thing that my biggest issue with the whole thing is that it's definitely a 16 year old Nancy as opposed to an 18 year old Nancy. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that that's totally fair, especially considering that, yeah, it was in the 1930s pre revision. So it was like a younger Nancy, but that was just kind of the disconnect that I had with it is that it, a lot of it didn't seem, people didn't seem to give Nancy enough credit. People didn't seem to take her as seriously as I think they took an 18 year old Nancy. Right. But I, I, but you know, like I said, I think that's fair because of she's supposed to be 16, 
And also, like, I don't have as much experience reading the older versions of the book to really know if that's a fair portrayal or not, you know? Right. All I know is the Nancy that's in my in my heart and mind, and that's uh, the, you know, post-revision Nancy, so. Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, do we want to get into a summary of the story? Yes, Okay. This one, it's only an hour movie. So if you're, you know, if you want to get your large for lane fix, this is a really quick and easy way to do it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it starts off and um, Nancy's in her school, a boarding yeah. school for young ladies. Uh, well, sorry. Is it a boarding school? Or no, sorry, not boarding school. I just wrote boarding school. Uh, oh. Bryn, Brynwood. That's what I was reading as boarding. It's Brynwood. <laughs> Brynwood School for Young Ladies. Mm-hmm. So we, we learn that Nancy is the chairman of her committee. I guess she's on a committee at her school that is going to decide how to use donated funds to improve the school. Um, and they have this alumni of the school, Mrs. Eldridge. She says she graduated 50 years ago as she's decided to leave $250,000 of her money to the school. Um, and Nancy's committee decides that they, they want to use it for a swimming pool. Mm-hmm. She's there with her, um, I guess, business representation, um, a man advisor. named, yeah, business advisor of some kind. Business manager? Yeah, Mr. Hollister. It's Hollister, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he seems a little shocked at the sub that he thought she was only going to be giving 200000 but actually she's going to be giving two hundred and fifty. She changed her mind. Mm-hmm. So they say that the next day they're going to be going to Carson Drew's office to finalize this donation. And all of the girls from the school, including Nancy, go there and they show up with a present to give to uh, Mrs. Eldridge. But she doesn't show. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So her business manager comes in and says that she has taken ill suddenly and she had to go out of town since her regrets, but she's not going to be able to make it. And Nancy is like, what's going on? You know, she was supposed to, you know, give us a donation. She was so sincere or whatever. And all of the other girls from the boarding school are all like kind of like talking bad about her being like, oh, well, you know, I bet she was just like basically having us on, like wasn't ever going to really give us the money. Mm -hmm. Um, And Nancy's like, don't talk about her that way. You know, I'm sure she's going to come back or I'm sure, you know, there's just some kind of issue or whatever. Um, And so like from the beginning, Nancy is trying to stick up for someone, the underdog, right? Um, And she wants to obviously try to find Mrs. Eldridge. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, this is when um, we get the the great scene from the book. Nancy is, I guess, driving home from this meeting where they're supposed to meet with Mrs. Eldridge and she sees Dr. Spire driving past. She sees him like get out of his car, get into another car and that car speeds away. Nancy's immediately alerted by this. But instead of just saying whatever, like in Mm -hmm. the book, she follows him. Yeah. But unfortunately, she gets a flat tire. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Pretty much immediately. Warded. I guess we don't really get the resolution from that, but I guess she has a spare. And so she makes it home and she goes to tell her father about this. And at that very same moment, Carson gets a call from Dr. Spire. It says, could you come over? I want to talk to you about something. And Nancy says, I'm coming too because I saw him kidnapped. And so they head over there. Oh, we also meet Ify in that scene. Oh, yes. Yes. Meet Effie in that scene. There's no Hannah in this story. No Hannah. Niece. Yeah. Effie. Well, okay. So that's my question though, is that, sorry, this is an aside. Is it actually her niece or did they just change Hannah's name to Effie? I guess we'll have to see in the next few movies. You've already seen the next one, but. Well, yeah, the next one doesn't Hannah address now. it. It's still just Effie. Yeah. Oh, okay. Then they probably just removed it. I'm Hannah. thinking they probably just changed it. Yeah. Which I thought was kind of just like a weird yeah, it's a Thanks. shame. I guess she really was only in the book so that she could sprain her ankle and they'd have a reason to go mm-hmm. visit Dr. Spire. But here it's just a phone call and Effie brings him the, the message. So Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Anyways, anyway, they go yeah. see Dr. Spire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he, oh, what does he tell them? Basically just that he was driven to uh, about an hour away. He thinks it's a pretty large house, but he couldn't really see where they were going. He's asked to treat a woman with a dislocated shoulder, and he heard a password, Bluebells. Bluebells, yeah. So Nancy and Carson basically tell him, like, yes, yeah, we're going to try to help you. And so then they decide to go to the police and report it to the police. On the way there, Carson makes a little, or Nancy makes a joke about them being followed, Mm -hmm. Ha ha, but turns out they They are really actually are being followed. (laughs) But they get to the police and we meet 
Captain Tweedy, not Chief McGinnis, but a Captain Tweedy. Again, random name change. Right. <laughs> I just don't understand why, but I don't know. This is um, an amazing scene. Though. It is. It was my <laughs> favorite part of the whole movie. This scene was because the the dynamic between the the police captain and Nancy is just really great throughout the whole movie. Um, but at the beginning, you know, she's like, you just need to look for this house out in the country, right? Like it, you know, within 30 miles. And he's like, just look for a house in the country. Like that's, that'll take forever. We'll never mm -hmm. be able to do that. I don't have time for that young lady or whatever. And then she tells him that she saw the last two numbers of the license plate. Mm -hmm. And he goes, oh, well, that's easy. I'll go look up all the numbers of license plates in the state. And Nancy's like, mm, how many license plates do you think that that'll be? And he's like, oh, I don't know, 20,000, 20, 40,000, something. And she goes, hmm. And you'll just be able to look through it so fast. Wow. <laughs> it's such a funny scene. And since we didn't see the state on the license, you mm -hmm. have to do every car with that license plate in the in the entire country. So that's like four million cars. It's amazing. You can do it so quickly. You're so wow. talented. What a great police officer you are. And Carson is just visibly sick of it as well. Mm -hmm. He's just like, all right, Nancy, stop showing up the police. Like Yeah. Oh, it was a great scene. <laughs> you should you should really watch the movie just for that scene alone. Right. Honestly. That scene and then all of the later interactions of Captain Tweedy and Nancy, because they're all great. So they leave the police station after reporting. And this is when Nancy notices that they actually really are being followed by a car. She tries to do a big turnaround. She doesn't do it at a light. This time she uses a roundabout and tries to follow them again. But Carson just stops her car. I was confused about how he actually did this. I couldn't tell. But it seems that he, to be that he just took the key out of the ignition. That's what it looked like. I had to go back and rewatch it because it was so strange. I was like, that seems unsafe. But <laughs> I don't know. Um, <laughs> also, you're in the middle of the road, not even off to the side or anything. He just stops her car and he's like, um, Nancy, you can't do this. This is getting too dangerous. You shouldn't follow these people or whatever. Which I thought, again, I don't want to sidetrack us during our summary, but was just not the way Carson and Nancy should interact. No. Carson, and it's even especially in Larkspur Lane, there are multiple times where he's like, this is dangerous. And, you know, I wish you wouldn't do this. But Nancy is always like, oh, dad, you're not going to make me stop. And he's like, no, I won't. Right. I know you want to do this. <laughs> But so that was definitely not the case in, in the movie. He definitely tries to get Nancy to stop investigating mm -hmm. and go so far as to pull her keys out of the ignition in the middle of the road. Yeah. So. Oh, Carson. Mm-hmm. Okay. We switch to a scene where it, I guess it's Nancy's driveway and we see some, some neighbor boys playing a game and they run over Nancy's flower bushes and she gets really upset. And then we meet Ted, not Ned, Ted Nickerson, mm -hmm. who is in his yard. I guess he's Nancy's next door neighbor and he's playing football in his yard. Mm -hmm. She calls, I just thought it was so funny. She calls the, um, the neighborhood boys or whatever. She calls them hoodlums. Yes. <laughs> not hoodlums, hoodlums. You hoodlums. You tramping all over my flowers. <laughs> that was a great accent. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so she talks to Ted and um, a neighbor boy comes up and brings them a pigeon. A pigeon, mm -hmm. I guess he found. He's not really clear on how he's gotten this pigeon. He says he's injured and so he's trying to look after it. Right. Um, and Nancy and Ted work out that it's actually a carrier pigeon. And Nancy finds the message clipped to his little leg mm -hmm. and looks at it. And I didn't write down the message, but it was something, something bluebells. <laughs> right. It wasn't whatever it was in the book. And I, no. I, I couldn't hear it because my version was so quiet. Mm. I don't think it was really relevant. All that was relevant about it was that Nancy recognized the word bluebells and associated that with the password that mm. Dr. Spires told her. And so she realized that it must be connected to the kidnappers. So mm. she and Ned, Ted, I'm going to keep saying Ned, Ted, she and Ted <laughs> find the number on the pigeon and she gets in touch with the, this is, see, it wasn't the American Federation of like yeah. pigeon financiers or whatever. 
Ted actually knows it this time. I wrote oh, it down yeah. as the American Pigeon Association. He says, well, obviously all pigeons are registered. So let's look up the number um, they do and they get back word that it's not registered with them. So Nancy kind of takes this as proof that something nefarious is going on here. Mm-hmm. He said, Carson then tells Nancy that she has to take the bird to the police. And Nancy's like, well, I guess I'll get Ted to help me take it over to the police. And in the process of doing so, the bird flies away and they have to to follow it. But not only that. So like Carson tells Nancy that she better, because she brings up the idea of following the pigeon back to where it came from or whatever, or where it's going. Right. And he tells her not to do that and, so, and instead to take it to the police. But mm-hmm. so then when she and Ted are on their way doing that, she, the pigeon is sitting in the car, like on the, her back seat, I guess, yeah. in like a crate, like a wooden crate that Ted built. And she, you could tell she gets this look in her eye mm-hmm. and she steps on the gas so that this poor pigeon, so that the crate falls off the back of her car and breaks so that the pigeon gets out mm-hmm. and flies away, basically. Yeah. So it was intentional, but she doesn't <laughs> want anyone to think it was intentional. Right, 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 right. <laughs> Ted totally knows, though. Ted oh, yeah. 100% knows that she did it on purpose. <laughs> and he's fed up with it because now she's going to drive while he right. watches for the pigeon. Mm-hmm. He even says, so he says, his neck hurts. Yes. And I was like, Effie's yes. wise. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, such a just stupid little tiny detail from the book. But I was just, I just felt so gratified yes. when I heard it that I was like, even they even put that detail in. That uh, Ted's neck started hurting, and so he lost the pigeon for a minute, but then they see it again. Mm-hmm. And they follow it to this estate or this house. And Ted waits there while Nancy goes to call the police. They get back, and then the police come with Carson. He's kind of upset because Nancy did something he asked her not to. Mm. But so the police go into the house and say that there's someone inside, and they pull out none other than Mr. Hollister. This is Eldra's business manager. Yes. How suspicious. He says, though, that he only rented this house starting today and that yesterday it was being rented by a man named Mr. Tucker. But he is now dead. Right. He's dead. (laughs) Supposedly. He's supposedly dead. Um, And so that's why they, you know, they can't track down why the pigeon might have come here. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He does so. He, there are still pigeons on the estate. He does show them the pigeons, but apparently Nancy can't find the pigeon that they followed there. I thought this scene was kind of like really weird because, like, the fact that you think that you could identify a pigeon amongst like what must be fifty other mm-hmm. pigeons in this pigeon coop that you could identify the one pigeon that you followed. Through uh, it, it just right. seemed a little far fetched, but whatever. Nancy says that it's not there, and so the police get very irritated with Nancy for you know putting them on a quote unquote wild goose chase, right. or really a wild pigeon chase. And Captain Tweedy even goes so far as to say that Nancy is having hallucinations, that she is psychotic, mm-hmm. which I thought was fascinating, and I have a lot to say about. Oh yeah, but we'll get there. And so the police leave and Nancy is, of course, really upset because she swore that she saw the pigeon fly there. Then the police leave and Nancy goes. But then we see the shot of Hollister Mm -hmm. finding the pigeon. um, And then he takes out a notepad and writes a message to the bad guys, essentially saying, uh, you know, the Drew girl is on to us. And I sent the police away. They mostly were just mad about this this goose chase that they were on and they believed me and then we see him tie the message to the pigeon's leg and send the pigeon off and then when we we see the bad guys that were following nancy and carson in the car read the message so um, we do know that he's involved at this point i was so disappointed by this Corey. i was i mean i one i mean it's not surprising at all that he was involved Mm. but i so wish that it would have been a reveal at the end right and that way it would have been like oh his you know, her business manager was in on it the whole time. But right. um, no, we learn like halfway through the movie. <laughs> oh, well. So then, so they get home and Ned said, or Ted says, oh, God, I'm going to keep doing it. Ted says that he's got to get home because he's leaving for Sylvan Lake that night. Mm-hmm. And so his family rented a cabin supposedly, and he needs to go get home so that he can head up there with them. 
So they are on their way home and they get home and Nancy and Ned are, you know, kind of stand sitting in the car talking about this and they see someone trying to break into Nancy's house. Right. And so she's like, Ted, do something. <laughs> and he's like, well, say, what do you want me to do about it, Nancy? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that's too good. That's so accurate. <laughs> And he, she's like, I don't know, Ted, tackle him or something. And so uh, he's like, well, suppose I tackle him and he doesn't stay down. And and she's like, well, I'll hit him over the head with this wrench. <laughs> and so um, he runs to tackle him and Nancy goes to after him with the wrench. But then they find out that it's actually Carson trying to get into the house because he forgot his key. <laughs> And so Nancy's like, okay, well, I have a key, so I'll let us in. And they go around, but they can't get through the door for some reason. Turns out it's been, like, barred. All this furniture is, like, stacked up against it. But Ned and Carson are able to get it open and get inside. And Effie's nowhere to be found. They're, like, screaming for her, whatever. Eventually, she comes out and says, there was this man who was trying to get into the house. Carson's like, that was me. She's like, no, it was before. It was a scary man. And I barricaded the door. They're like, why didn't you call the police? She's like, I didn't think to. I didn't think about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> and they're like, okay. Um, and Carson's just like, well, go put all this furniture back where, where you got it from. And she's like, oh, okay, whatever. So she goes away and they hear a blood curdling I know. scream. <laughs> scared the crap out of me yes. when it happened because I was wearing my headphones. And it was like so loud. I have honestly, I have never, even like jump scares in like horror movies uh, are like, that was as, as startling as this was. Because mm -hmm. it was just so, it was like mid, like they were like mid dialogue. Carson, Nancy, and Ted were like mid dialogue. So you weren't expecting it. You're fully paying attention to Nancy, Carson, mm -hmm. Ned, and then suddenly it's not even on screen anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Blood curdling scream. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was and great. She comes walking backwards into the room and who's in front of her but a guy holding a gun. Mm hmm. Calls mm -hmm. them all at gunpoint in the living room. Mm -hmm. He says, you better stop investigating, you know, this Nancy Drew or whatever. Uh, if if you don't, the first, the, the first thing that she does, she's going to get it, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and so Carson's like, chill out. We're, you know, we're going to stop. We're actually, we're going to leave town tonight. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be fine. Which, why tell the bad guys where you're going? But I don't know. I don't know. He also mentions that if they don't stop, then what happened to Dr. Spire is going to mm -hmm. look like a, you know, he's going to look beautiful oh, yeah. compared to them. So we know that Dr. Spire has been beat up at this point, basically, because he went and talked to Nancy about Mrs. Aldridge. Yeah, we forgot to mention that. Nancy got a message or Carson got a message. Oh, no, it was in the newspaper. It was, it was the front page of the newspaper that the doctor had gotten beat up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which definitely didn't happen in the... Um, in the book but it was yeah intense so the bad guy leaves and carson tries to get nancy to go with him to st louis he got word that mrs eldridge was there that mm -hmm. mr hollister had contacted him and said that there that she's in st louis in a sanatorium and carson and nancy are going to go the next day to to go see her and find out what happened mm -hmm. but wait hold on a second why does nancy want to go to sylvan lake I forgot. She says that she doesn't believe that Mrs. Eldridge is really in St. Louis. But do we know why? I feel like there was some reason, there was a reason why she wanted to go to Sylvan Lake with Ted instead of going to St. Louis with Carson. Oh, oh, because she and Ted have this conversation that, oh, well, the first house oh. that we were at was, was the wrong place because the bird right. was flying, you know, to its destination rather than its, um, you know, where it was, wherever it was leaving from. Right. So now to figure out where they were leaving from, they have to go 30 miles in the other direction, which is around Sylvan Lake. And Ted's right. family's going there anyway. So Nancy convinces Carson that, oh, well, they invited me. So I might as well, you know, instead of staying here, going with you, I'm just going to go with their family to the lake for a few days. Yeah. And Carson, yeah. Carson's really satisfied with this. Cause oh, you know, hopefully he thinks Nancy's going to be entirely out of the way of this whole thing. So he's not worried about her when he goes to St. Louis, mm -hmm. but so obviously, yeah, Nancy is going to Sylvan Lake to further investigate. Ted doesn't want to do this. Ted is so at this point is like, so totally <laughs> fed up uh -huh. with Nancy and her antics. But you know, she bas basically just, pushes him around like a broom and you know he is kind of captive to her will <laughs> 
So they get to Sylvan Lake. They're eating breakfast. Yes. Nancy says that she needs to go into town to send Carson a wire. Um, so mm-hmm. he, he convinces or she convinces Ted to take her into town for that day. Um, so they do. They go into town. They get a wire from Carson. I don't think they really know anything except that Carson can't find her or something. Or no, it's Mr. Hollister didn't mm-hmm. show up. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Hollister hasn't shown up, so whatever. It's just kind of strange. Mm-hmm. But then, so as they're going to leave, Nancy sees Mr. Hollister like coming out of a building across the street, and she's like, "What is he doing in Sylvan Lake? If he's supposed to be in St. Louis?" And she tries to follow him. She wants to follow him, mm-hmm. but Ted accidentally knocks over some like milk crates and delays oh, yeah. them, and they can't follow him. him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, So Nancy's trying to figure out, well, you know, how are we going to find this um, estate or this house or whatever that Dr. Spires was held at? Ted makes a joke like, well, I don't know how you're going to find it unless you like went up in a plane or whatever to, you know, look at the area or whatever. And she goes, what a great idea, Ted. How much does that cost? He's like, well, the guy down at the lake charges Ted. Hold on. No, no, no. We can't. (laughs) We're not going to do that. Um, But eventually he even ends up Forking over two dollars to help me yeah. have the car <laughs> to do it. Yeah, they go up in the plane and um, they're kind of looking around the area. And um, Nancy thinks she sees it, and she leans out of the plane to like take pictures of it. She almost falls out of the plane. Yeah. First of all, Ted has to like grab her to hold her in, and she t- takes pictures of the area basically. Mm-hmm. When they get back to ground, Ted develops the photos because apparently he in his photo developing skills yeah in addition to all of his other skills he apparently can also do that and they are able to figure out from the pictures where exactly this house is how far away from the highway is where the turnoff is where the bridge is and everything Mm -hmm. that dr spires said he crossed yeah they make like an aerial map using the collection of photos that nancy took it was really cool 1938 google maps it seemed slightly like far-fetched, far-fetched yeah <laughs> but but it was cool yeah yeah so they decide to drive over there and they do see a sign that says larkspur lane mm-hmm. and nancy is like oh bluebells are kind of larkspur mm-hmm. so this must be the place and so they go in nancy tries to first climb the fence but ted stops her because it's like electrified at the top and he's like are you gonna are you crazy you're gonna kill yourself And instead, she dresses Ted up like a nurse, and she dresses up like an old lady, just like the books, to sneak in to the facility. And once they get in there, Ted, like, waits on a bench for her. She goes in, tries to find Mrs. Eldridge's room, Mm -hmm. is able to. She has the whole scene with Mrs. Eldridge. Oh, and she goes in the room. Mrs. Eldridge screams. And Mrs. Tyson comes in and Nancy has to hide under the bed. Tyson's like, what are you yelling about in here? You're just trying to make trouble. And just the same as the book. It's exactly the same. It's great. And Nancy tells Mrs. Eldridge to put on like her veil and everything that she was wearing so that they don't recognize her as they try to leave. Mm -hmm. Um, So they get to the car. There's a scene where Ted almost gets um, injured or somehow this bad guy goes after him, but he's Mm -hmm. able to like, duck down and the guy trips over him and falls into a wheelchair and knocks himself unconscious. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty ridiculous. But then they all get into the car and they start driving away. But then they, they get caught again. Mm-hmm. Which was crazy. This was the most, I thought this was the, this was scene was where I really like out loud went, Oh, come on. <laughs> like they were so close to making it out of the gate that literally if Ted just gunned it, He could have done it, but instead they stop because the guy at the gate holds up a gun through the passenger side window. Just go, just go. But he stops the car. And so now, now they're caught basically. And we do also get an explanation from Mrs. Eldridge. She does tell Nancy that just all of a sudden um, the night before she was supposed to donate the money, she started feeling really sick. And Mr. Hollister was like, I know where to take you. And he ended up bringing her here. Oh, so after they get caught, they find Nancy in the trunk and they basically take them all into Mr. Tucker's office. But we don't really know that that's him. We never I don't think we ever get his name. Yeah, we don't really know the names of any of the three guys because there's like Mm -hmm. Tucker and then his two goons that follow Nancy in the car. So I'm not really sure which one was which. But 
you know, they're all pretty sinister and they're standing around discussing what they're going to do with the three of them. Mm -hmm. It's decided basically that Mrs. Eldridge will go back to her room. Mrs. Tyson's going to mind her, make sure she doesn't escape again. And he's going to put Nancy and Ted in the basement Mm -hmm. while they figure something out, I guess. And uh, Mrs. Eldridge is really upset by this and is like, I want to know what you're going to do to these children. And it seemed to kind of like, well, don't give them any ideas, Mrs. Eldridge. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But um, she was really upset. And so they're like, well, we're never going to get any money out of her now. We can get money out of the Drews and the Nickersons, though, Mm -hmm. if we ransom their children. Right, 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 right. So they put them down in the basement and they find a kitten. I didn't understand this. (laughs) Just randomly. This seemed just like one of the most random plot points that you would find in a Nancy Drew mystery. So mm. it seemed to fit to me. Yeah. But it was but it was so random. I agree. It was just like, there's a kitten. I really appreciated it. Uh, getting mm. to look at an adorable kitten. Nancy got to hold a really cute, really cute, fluffy kitten. Yeah. Um, but yeah, ultimately had no bearing. And we don't know what happens to the kitten. Yeah, Which, she's just holding it, and then that's it. So. I guess she leaves it there or whatever. <laughs> but Sad I know. to think about. I know. Um, but they find an x-ray machine, yeah. an old x-ray machine, and Ted is like, say, there's an old x-ray machine here. And I guess he just knows that. Or, and I think to a certain extent, we as the audience are supposed to know how this works too, even though Nancy doesn't. But apparently somehow you can use an x-ray machine to like interrupt like radio broadcast signals Mm -hmm. or something. Um, So he's able to transmit a message of some kind that is being picked up by radios and radio Mm -hmm. frequencies all across the even the River Heights area, it seems like. And it's in in Morse code, so he's using the x-ray machine, turning it off and on in in Morse code. He just knows. Apparently, he just knows Morse code. Was that a thing? Like, did people just learn Morse code like a freaking language? I think he did know Morse code. He was also, we do also see him um, in the pigeon scene where he's trying to figure out where the pigeons come from. We see him Mm. operating a ham radio as well. So it's assumed that he had a little bit of knowledge, maybe with the radio part from that, but... (laughs) Whatever. It it works somehow and the police ended up picking up his his interference and they identify it as being Morse code and they figure out the message. Mm-hmm. So um, the police are on their way, but at the same time, um, the bad guys are taking Ned and Nancy out of the basement, trying to get them into a car, I guess, to take them to some kind of secondary location. And in the process, he's this bad guy's holding a gun on Nancy and Ned like bumps into him. And he drops the gun at Nancy's feet and she picks it up and holds it at him. And she's like shaking or whatever. And she's mm-hmm. like, don't you come any closer to me or I'll shoot. But then she literally starts shooting. Yeah. <laughs> she closes her eyes and, and starts just starts shooting. randomly shooting everywhere. And it's at this point that the police storm in but and she's fortunately i guess used up all her ammunition and was just pulling clicks on the gun oh my gosh and the police come in to save the day yeah (laughs) (laughs) they do they save the day carson also arrives um and then they're they're looking for ted and they're like oh where's where's ted and nancy's like oh dad maybe i shot him (laughs) (laughs) yeah nancy you closed your eyes but he's fine. He was hiding under a car and he says, is the war over yet? <laughs> he's very funny. He's definitely the comic relief character. But then we do see all the old ladies get saved from, from their awful fate. And um, the police kind of, you know, gives give Nancy some credit finally. Mm-hmm. And thanks to Mrs. Eldridge, who is there in the car on the way back. And yeah, Captain Tweedy is like, oh, you know, like, thank goodness, or whatever, you're all safe. And Mrs. Uh, Eldridge goes, well, mostly thanks to Nancy Drew. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And then we get, like, that end scene is Nancy and Ned asleep in, like, a car being towed by the police car. Mm -hmm. And she, like, wakes up out of a sleep and she goes, stay, stay where you are, or, like, stay, stay back or something. Stay right there. And falls back asleep on Ned's shoulder. 
Well, Carson says something to, cause Tweety says something to Carson and Carson's like, yeah, my Nancy, she's, you know, she's more awake than all you police oh, officers yeah. combined. And then we just see the scene of her asleep on Ned's shoulder or Ted's shoulder. Like, Oh, oh what, what's, what's going on? <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, it was really cute. Uh, yeah. a really cute movie. Definitely funny. So yeah, this was, um, it was a wrong. Yeah, it was really good. <laughs> Rollick in a good time. It was. Overall, I thought they did a pretty good job of adapting it for, for a movie. Yeah, I totally agree. Especially the fact when you consider that the runtime is only like an hour and five minutes. Mm-hmm. The amount that they were to, able to get in there, I felt was, yeah, it was really solid. It was a really solid adaption. I think. Mm-hmm. I think, yeah, so my biggest issues with it overall are Nancy's age. I just felt like she was too young, but I get Mm -hmm. that she was actually 16 in the books at that time. Mm -hmm. My other issue is, like, how they kind of, like, yeah, discredit Nancy, but that has to do with her age. Also, we don't get, like, a super lot of backstory about Nancy. Like, we don't really understand that this is something that she does. Right. Right. And so I felt like that kind of played into it. They made it seem like this was like the one and only time Nancy has ever really investigated anything. Right. And so it just seemed like if if they were going to be, it, it seemed like they were criticizing her as they should have if it was her only investigation. But right. the fact that Nancy Drew was this like established series, like it made me want to know like, well, okay, is this like, secret of the old clock nancy or is this you know yeah book seven or whatever yeah right my other thing my other issue which you haven't talked about yet is carson and nancy's relationship yeah yeah well i guess i did talk about it a little bit i just yeah i didn't appreciate how he was trying to stifle her and stop her from investigating i felt like that was not something that the carson of the books would do but again i don't know if that's just because i'm used to reading the revised versions or if that's actually you know not how it it should be in the books yeah. that makes sense so i don't know when i watched i watched the second one i watched nancy drew reporter and i felt the same way about it i felt like he 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 babied her and there's literally a scene in nancy drew reporter where he like picks her up and like rocks her and sings her like it's it's funny it's a funny moment okay. it's not as creepy as it's it's a little okay. creepy <laughs> but it's not as creepy as it sounds gotcha <laughs> um he like sings like her uh, like he calls her like a baby and he sings her like this song about babies or something and puts her to sleep and i just felt like that was just so indicative of their entire you know the relationship the way it's portrayed in in those movies is that he treats her like a child which again, you know, I just want to say is fair if she's 16 and if it's the first cases that she's ever investigated. It yeah. just doesn't, it doesn't feel like the Nancy from the books. That'll put that cap on. <laughs> they do start it pretty abruptly. The only real introduction we get is from, I guess, some administrator at the school saying, okay, and now Nancy is going to introduce Mrs. Eldridge, basically. And so that's how we find out that she's on this committee and attends this school. Mm-hmm. Even so, even in that scene, or it might be later in the second scene where they're all in the office together. I don't remember, but she um, is someone comes up and says, Oh, Nancy, you should present that. Oh yeah. They're talking about the gift. You should present this to Mrs. Eldridge. And she's like, Oh no, I don't need to be the one making all the speeches or whatever. And another student says, Oh no, you should, it'll be great practice for when you're, you're a lawyer. And the teacher comes up. The teacher comes up and she goes, oh, Nancy, I didn't know you wanted to be a lawyer. And she says, yes, I think every intelligent woman should have a career. That was so cool. It was such a good moment. But interesting to know that she wants to be a lawyer and I'm not a in my notes as well. Yeah. yeah. Which, you know, makes sense because her dad's a lawyer. But, um, you know, I just think that like at this point, even in the books, Nancy would say she'd want to be a detective. Right. Maybe she'd want to work for the police, but, you know. She'd want to be a detective. So maybe this is her first case in, you know, in the Bonita Granville universe. Yeah, maybe so. (laughs) Maybe so. Okay, let's see. I had an issue with the lack of female characters in this Mm. story. We do have a few. We have Mrs. Aldridge. We have Evie. Effie? Effie. (laughs) We have Mrs. Aldridge and we have Effie. But they really are the only 
female characters besides Nancy that have more than like one or two lines each. We don't have, we don't have Besser George. Helen's not in this one. The Cornings, they aren't in this one, but we just, we don't see Mm -hmm. anything besides Nancy and, you know, these two other characters and Effie, she is pretty much useless in, in the Drew household. Every scene that she's in, she's incompetent basically. And then Mrs. Eldridge is written off as like this helpless old sick lady. So she's not really, you know, portraying, a strong role model for Nancy either. We do. So at the very beginning, there are a lot of like classmates of Nancy's and mm-hmm. like, I'm assuming like a headmistress or some teacher of some kind, but they're only in the first two scenes mm-hmm. and yeah, they don't ever return after those first two scenes. We don't even know their names. So right. yeah. And they, they're, they're not the best. I think <gasps> that they are just there to kind of, to be contrast to Nancy of Nancy's this, this kind hearted, warm person that sees the best in Mrs. Eldridge and wants to, you know, look into what happened to her. But the other girls kind of jump on Nancy right away. And are like, Oh, you must've been, um, you know, you must've known this, like you must've been in on this and they're just kind of jerks to her. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's definitely so for like a series that seems to kind of be about like female empowerment, Mm -hmm. there's not a lot of female empowerment in this movie. Aside from oh, that wow. one line from Nancy about thinking every intelligent woman should have a career, we, she even she throughout the movie doesn't seem to have a lot of agency, like a super lot. I yeah. feel like most of the ideas come from Ted. They do, yeah. And Absolutely her, they do. The only the only real agency that she shows is in her like rebellious nature, right? Mm-hmm. Seems like she's always trying to be like contrary to what other people are telling her to do, like people in authority, like the police and Carson, which I appreciate. But like ultimately, her like investigating and her like getting out of scrapes or whatever is not due to her own intelligence, her own. Um, will or bravery or anything it's just circumstances and ted (laughs) right yeah all the all the major characters that are billed for this movie besides nancy are carson mr hollister ted the bad guys mr Mm -hmm. tucker and captain tweety right it's all male characters except for nancy drew the you know the main title character and you're right all the ideas do come from ted he even makes a joke at one point like oh i gotta come up with the ideas and i gotta finance them too The Morse code is his idea. The pigeon thing is his idea. He comes up with the x-ray idea. Mm -hmm. So it's just one thing after another. He even says something to Nancy about like, oh, well, obviously the pigeon Mm -hmm. would have been coming from the other direction. And she's like, oh, yeah, of course. Maybe we should just go look over where it was coming from rather than where it was headed. It's all Ted. Yep. Yep. And that is definitely not the way that it is in the books. Like it, it like is in stark contrast to the books. That's not to say that Other people, other characters in the books don't have inputs and have ideas at certain points. But the majority of the investigation of like, I know where we should go. I know where we should look. I know what we should do comes from Nancy. And that's not the case in the movie. I hope it will be better in the next one. I'm, I mean, I'm, I've seen the cast list, so I know that it's probably not, but. I will say, so yeah, in Nancy Drew Reporter, there's the addition of uh, Ned's little sister, Mary, and one of her friends. And so they tag along on a lot of the investigating. And it's definitely an interesting addition. I am not really sure how I feel about it. And if we ever do cover that movie, I'll talk about it more in depth in there. But it did feel like an attempt to kind of create some balance. But I I didn't really feel like it was intended to balance the femininity or female characters at all but more an attempt to like balance the age for like a younger audience Mm -hmm. so meh but they're definitely so in this in uh nancy drew detective there definitely were not any characters of color nobody nobody in it who wasn't white not a single person (laughs) not even a background extra i didn't see Mm -hmm. and so that's you know that's to note in nancy drew reporter they go to a chinese restaurant and oh. there are Chinese owners and waiters in that restaurant. And so, but that, I mean, that's, of course, its own issue. Yeah. <laughs> but at least they're there. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Can't say I'm surprised, of course. Right. I do also have an issue with the, the age representation of Mrs. Eldridge. She's mm. made up to be this, like, 
super, super old, frail lady. Of course, she's the same way in the book. But at the very first scene, we find out that she graduated 50 years ago. So, or she attended the school 50 years ago. So at most, she's like 65 to 70, right? So 16, 50 years ago, you know, so it's, it's not like she's about to like, you know, die of old age at any second. She's just retired kind of age, which is older, but it's not elderly by any means, but they kind of refer to her as this like old lady that's going to die at any second. Well, even, yeah, I mean, even like her portrayal, like, I mean, she's certainly the makeup or whatever wig or whatever they put her in or whatever actress they cast for the role. um, Definitely seems like it should be older, like just visually, but like she gets around fine. Yeah. Like there's, she's, she doesn't even use a cane. There's no wheelchair situation or anything. Right. She walks fine. Um, and so, yeah, there doesn't, it doesn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> Although I will say that in the end, when they're in the car, like driving back and the Captain Tweedy, he says, we rescued like all you old dames or elderly dames or something. He says, Captain Tweedy is probably the same age. <laughs> she, she gives him like a look and is like, like, you know, careful or whatever. And he like corrects himself from saying dames to saying like ladies. Okay. Um, and so I didn't know if that was supposed to be like dames is like a bad word kind of, or like a slang word or whatever, or if it was supposed to be like, don't call me old. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. And so maybe, I don't know, maybe to a certain extent, there's a little bit of awareness about elderly shoehorning, mm-hmm. you know? So I don't know. They're treating her like she's, you know, yeah. 105 and she's like 65. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, it's just <laughs> it's hilarious to think about like the, like my mother-in-law is 65 or not even, she's like 60, she's in her mid 60s. You wouldn't call her elderly, I bet. No, my <laughs> gosh, no, 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 absolutely <laughs> not. My parents are getting up there too. Yeah. And they're definitely aging, you know, that happens in your Life. later years but yeah. have all this. but like no they're not old no <laughs> that's decrepit no, like, oh she's gonna die any second so we need to get <laughs> that money before it gets willed to something like no oh it's <laughs> well so it was because she was struck ill right like she they don't really say how or with what but like the day after she goes to like give that presentation to the girls they mention in the bad guys mention in their little bad guy office that she had some kind of illness that came up suddenly and that's how they were able to get her into the home. Her business manager somehow coerced her to go there when she was sick. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So she, she really might've been sick. I took it as like, he put something in her drink that oh. made her feel bad. Like maybe he wasn't oh. poisoning her to like kill her or anything, but maybe it was it like induced this sickness in yeah. some way. And then he was like, Oh, you, thing this happened last time let's go to this place that i just heard about you know that's so interesting i yeah that had not, had not even crossed my mind but you're right that totally could have been what happened i don't think that they necessarily indicated that but i kind of took it that way so mm-hmm. i yeah i seem to take it as more of like a a crime of like circumstance like this okay. business manager just knew of this place that did this thing you know you know and when she happened to become ill he was like all right this is this is it this is my mm-hmm. chance you know it just seemed a little too coincidental that mm-hmm. right before she was supposed to give this money like he he must it's have true. done something to That's her so to, true like before she could give the money away he did this to her you're probably right you're probably 100 percent right and i just didn't pick up on it yeah or maybe he didn't even give her anything maybe he just like gaslighted her yeah. into like, oh, you look terrible. Let's go to a doctor. Like, you know. Something well, he like says, that. so he says to the girls at the very beginning that like, oh, she's so, you know, she's really eccentric and mm-hmm. she's particularly, you know, worried about getting sick or getting ill. Mm-hmm. He specifically makes a point to say that, you know, laying the groundwork, right? Mm, yeah. There is mm. a little bit of trickery going on here. Ooh. I don't think they ever specifically say anything about this, like, you know, everlasting youth serum. No. It was this what the doctor was doing in the previous book. Which, thank goodness, because what a (laughs) far-fetched plot. Like, why? Yeah, no, so yeah, thank goodness they didn't do that. It was just a care home where they were trying to get ladies to sign over their money. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Goodness. 
So Mary Eldridge is still apparently from St. Louis. Just wanted mm. to point that out. Yeah, we don't meet any of the other Eldridge family. No. Oh, okay. So I read this cool thing. So a few, so a, there's like a, a lot of lines in the movie about, I'll bet you 2380. They say it all the time. Mm -hmm. And thanks to uh, NancyDrewSleuth.com, I know what that means. Apparently, it's slang from the 1930s. 2380 was the weekly paycheck amount given to the WPA workers during the Great Depression. So mm -hmm. like uh, public works workers. Mm -hmm. And so they said, you know, I'll bet you 2380 it's supposed to mean like a great amount, like a week's worth of money. I'll, give I'll bet that. my paycheck on that. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. Huh. Yeah. Thanks, NancyDrewSleuth.com. Yeah. Jennifer Fisher. Thank you. <laughs> She's so smart. So much knowledge. That's so interesting. Okay. Oh, okay. So we should talk about Captain Tweety calling her a psychopath. Oh, yes. <laughs> so, yeah, this, I mean, this kind of goes hand in hand with people not taking Nancy seriously. But I think it's really important to just remark upon the fact of this is how women all the time, even today, are written off, right? You get called mm -hmm. crazy. You get called emotional. But, like, it's literally... Terrible hysterical right mm. this is from so long ago this is something that people have done and it's just very like clearly represented in this movie and i i don't know maybe it's because you know we have progressed somewhat to where even when someone calls you crazy today it's like okay well they're just brushing me off and i mm. can you know move on with my life or whatever but how scary must it be to be a teenage girl and have a cop a male like a captain mm -hmm. with authority in the police force say that you are having hallucinations and you are psychopathic mm -hmm. like because when i hear things like that i think of institutionalization right you know i, I guess we really haven't even like breached that really in the 1930s at this point that was more of like a 1950s issue i mean i'm sure it was still an issue we just didn't it just wasn't as publicized, maybe. But it was criminalized, basically. I mean, not le like legally, but it was that was the, the implication of, hey, you're insane. So we're mm -hmm. going to throw you in jail, throw you in this like padded room. Right. And so like thinking about like you are trying to investigate and a cop tells you that about yourself or whatever, like that's scary. Mm -hmm. That could be like, OK, well, you know, they could have grounds to lock me away, basically. Mm -hmm. Like, so no wonder Nancy's so upset. Yeah. Yeah. I just thought that was interesting, too, because I, you know, I said it earlier, too, like just the fact that like people don't take Nancy seriously. I just felt like it was just such an interesting dynamic for her to have with the police in this in this movie, especially considering the interaction, all the interactions she has with the police in the books, which are so, oh, you're right, Nancy. Oh, that's a great point, Nancy. Oh, way to go, Nancy. Great job. And she has such a supportive relationship with Chief McGinnis, especially to like see this kind of like attacking relationship between Captain Tweedy and Nancy. It just felt really probably more realistic, you know, yeah. obviously, especially, you know, considering Nancy is a teenage girl but not not in line with with what i expected to see or what i wanted to see which is the relationship that they showed in the books you know right maybe they just put it in there to have it be even like uh, you know nancy shows the police up even more when she does solve it but it just seemed kind of sad it was just a little too real to see the 16 year old mm -hmm. girl face sexism in that way and very obvious misogyny right so, uh, I mean, like, yeah, I get, I understand why, especially in movies, but, you know, in books too, but especially in movies, it makes sense to try to like, you know, ratchet up the stakes, right? Like mm -hmm. there's more set against a character, so there's more to rise above. Right. But yeah, I just, overall, I didn't, I, I wanted to see, you know, what I read, you know, what yeah. the reason why I love the books, which is, and, and to some extent, which is because it's a little fanciful right it's a yeah. little bit unrealistic but we don't go to the movies to see real life not no. always <laughs> Man. okay anything else you want to say about it it was really cool to you know hear that old hollywood not only the accent but oh. the song and just yeah it was so cool okay their voices i listen <laughs> 
I let, while I get, I understand the, you know, it's like an old Hollywood thing. They call like the, tr- what do they call that accent? Like a transcontinental or something or something continental like, accent or something that. just because it was just the accent that people used in movies. And I, while I like that in like old movies, you know, sometimes mm-hmm. I didn't want it in my Nancy Drew. Ned, especially his voice was so like, he sounded like a 45 year old and like <laughs> a 14 year old's body. Like yeah. it, it was so jarring. I was mm-hmm. like, I could not overall. Oh yeah. We should just talk about Ted overall because yeah. I, <laughs> his voice was so awkward and annoying. He was definitely put in for comic relief. While mm-hmm. I thought a lot of his moments were funny. There was that scene where someone drops something on one of his feet. Nancy drops something oh. on another one of his foot. And then he drops something on his own foot. Mm -hmm. all while like holding his hands up in front of like the robbers (laughs) when the bad guy has him at gunpoint nancy's holding a wrench in her hand and then effie has something else in her hand he's like you ladies drop that and then so they do but then it falls on his foot and he's just like oh and then he has to drop something on his own well he the bad guy tells him because he bends down to pick up the wrench when the bad guy like turns to look at carson or something and then the bad guy turns back and goes don't you dare or whatever and then he drops it and drops it oh okay (laughs) that was good was really funny I couldn't stand him, hated him. And then maybe it was just because all of the ideas seemed to come from him. And that's why I felt like, oh, that guy, (laughs) you know, gets to take all the credit, takes to take all of Nancy's lines or whatever. Mm -hmm. I just felt like he, I think he looked a lot like I would imagine Ned Nickerson to look, um, just younger. Yeah. But overall, I felt like his, his character of being like this, kind of put upon like not wanting to help Nancy, Mm -hmm. which is in sharp contrast to the Ned that we see, especially in Clue in the Diary, who's just falling over himself to help Nancy, (laughs) like always showing up at her door, always calling him. And Nancy is the one who has to be kind of coy and kind of play like hard to get a little bit. Mm -hmm. That's not what happened in the movie at all. Nancy is like after this boy to get him to do stuff for her, you know? Yeah. Which I think in itself is kind of funny to watch, right? It's funny to see and fun to see Nancy pretty much just absolutely maneuver him, like moving him around like a chess piece on a chessboard. I said, I've said a lot of those today. That's okay. (laughs) But like, that's not, that's not what it's supposed to be. (laughs) Was he supposed to be like a love interest in this? Because we only really had one moment um, where I was suspecting that maybe at the end the when she's asleep on his shoulder yes the, the fence, fence. When she's about to try to climb the fence and he's like dance nancy don't do it it's electrified i 100 percent thought they were gonna kiss oh ted you saved my life and she's just a little too like over the top and sincere with how grateful she mm-hmm. is to have been yanked off this fence when really she was like six feet away from danger like she had a, <laughs> a while before anything happened yeah I 100% thought they were going to kiss in that moment. I so too. They like came like they were like breathy and all like kind of close to each other. And I was like, oh, if it happens, I'm going to scream. But they yeah. didn't. And so, yeah, it seemed kind of like and I don't know, maybe it was because it's the 1930s and this is supposed to be like a kid's movie. Maybe there is something about that that they just didn't want to put any kissing in or any kind of romance or whatever. Maybe they didn't think that that was the right audience. I'm glad they didn't. Yeah. Maybe, maybe that scene was the scandalous scene. Yeah, it could have been. It could have been. I think it, it's kind of interesting to think about how much of like the implication or whatever is just lost to time. Mm-hmm. And we'll never really know what or how audiences kind of read that. For mm-hmm. big movies, maybe, but like not not Nancy Drew Detective, which yeah. wasn't, <laughs> you know? Hey, if you're you're listening to this and this is your era, you remember seeing this movie come out, let us know what you thought of it at the time. I'd love to hear that perspective. Oh my gosh, yes, that would be so cool. We'll have you on. Talk yeah. about it. <laughs> Tell us all about it. <laughs> Tell us what snacks were at the movie theater, what car you drove in to get there. Was it a drive in? Like <laughs> <laughs> even imagine. What did you think of Benita Granville? I don't know. Oh, I, I love her in anything well, so- anything else. I love overall. I loved her. I feel like a lot of the issues with Nancy, which are the issues that I see with Nancy, just always are mm-hmm. in the writing of Nancy. Yes. No, I thought she was a great actress. I thought she did. She was great. I think. Yeah. Again, she just looked young. I felt like overall, it was just that she was really energetic, mm-hmm. and I felt like. But again, I think this 
plays into the same issue that I was talking about with her age. She just didn't feel confident enough to me. Mm -hmm. Um, But that's, that's again, due to the writing and not to Benita Granville's acting. Mm -hmm. She just felt, it just felt like she could have been a little bit more cool and confident and capable and in control of herself. But Mm -hmm. she felt a lot of the time to be nervous, especially with the gun, um, oh, she's yeah. like shaking when she, you know, pointed the gun or whatever. And I feel like Nancy wouldn't do that. Nancy would, even if she wasn't confident, even if, you know, under it all, she was feeling fear, she would put on a face, put on a brave oh, yeah. face because she knew that she had to in that moment or whatever. Absolutely. But that's not what we got. So we also had her be very excitable, like in the scene where she's trying to tell Carson about seeing Dr. Spire get kidnapped. She can't even like get the words out. Mm-hmm. We're like, Book Nancy would be like, okay, dad, this is what happened. This is what we need to do next. Like, here's our plan. This Nancy is just like, oh my goodness, I saw a car and then the car blew up. And I didn't even blow up. It blew out. And like, mm-hmm. Nancy, what's going on? No, my car was the one that blew out. And like, okay. Well. Yeah. And she never really got the story out. She was just so excitable that she couldn't, couldn't right. form her words. Yeah. And I think, yeah, I think even, well, I don't know if we see a super lot of Nancy and Carson's like, discussing cases in the books i feel like we just get like a statement like nancy and carson talked about it or whatever Mm -hmm. and so maybe we don't necessarily see that but i feel like most of those conversations the ones that we do see start off with nancy instead of offering information she's asking for it right Mm -hmm. so instead of explaining to everybody you know what everything she's done and everything she's been through she'd be like dad did you know about this or did you see this or Have you heard from Dr. Spire today? Right, 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 right. Which is just a much more like keeping her cards close to her chest kind of a Nancy. Again, more Mm. cool, more collected, more confident than, yeah, falling over herself to try to tell somebody about her day. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Nancy. What did you think about her hairstyle? I thought it was fine. Yeah. I mean, it's just the style that you'd expect for for the 30s. What about you? I thought it was... I mean, for the late 30s, yeah, but, like, I thought it was too long. I liked the curls. I thought the curls were good, but I just thought, uh, and it was so fluffy and voluminous. I was so surprised. <laughs> I was like, wow, that's um, quite a hairdo. Like, sometimes when she would, like, take her hat off or whatever, it would just get, like, <laughs> massive, yeah. um, which was fun to see, but I just thought, I don't know. I never expected Nancy with, like, curly, voluminous hair, you right. know? Because I feel like that would get in the way of her detecting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> also, so Benita Granville is definitely blonde. She's a blonde. But okay. in the movie posters that I've seen, they're all redheaded. Like they paint okay. her hair red. And Do they? I don't know if that's just like a later thing. Like maybe those have been like repainted and redrawn, you know, from the 1938, 1939 versions but she would have still been blonde she would have still been blonde but i mean like once nancy's hair color changed tradition from blonde like maybe they went back and i don't know Hmm. this doesn't seem likely to me but right but i thought that was interesting especially for the time considering that nancy was supposed to be blonde at the time right right? i was just confused by that and maybe maybe it's supposed to be i don't know more strawberry blonde and it just looked red to me i don't know but it just again adds to the confusion around nancy's hair color and i don't know why it's such a sticking point in my head but i feel like i need to know (laughs) what color nancy's hair is i'm googling a picture of her because i hadn't seen i hadn't seen like an in color picture of her it's all Mm. black and white no this is all just black and white oh no here we go no that's She's blonde. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Maybe it's just the lighting, though. Hmm. I mean, she might be like a strawberry blonde, but like you Maybe. should look at like the comparison between like that and the color of it on the Nancy Drew detective in color poster, whatever it is, because it's definitely like red, red. Interesting. Huh. Maybe it's because of the background. I don't know. Maybe. Because the background's definitely red in some of them. Maybe it's just like a stylistic choice on some of the ones I've seen where it just looks really red. Oh, even in that one. Yeah, I can see what you mean. But this is like a recolored. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was talking about. Hmm. Okay, I did. I found one where she does look blonde. Okay. So yeah, I've seen two. Do we want to talk about the movie posters a little bit? Sure. Yeah, yeah. I've seen two different 
main posters. There's probably a, a series of ones that were, you know, used for advertising at the time. But there's one that just says Nancy Drew Detective, and it looks like the words are kind of on a badge. Um, and it says, smashing a crime ring is child's play for this 16-year-old detective. <laughs> and then the other one, it looks like Nancy is being grabbed from behind by a guy in gloves and a scary hat and something covering his face. Yeah. I think the Nancy Drew reporter ones are a little bit more indicative of what I'm talking about with the red hair. Okay. Um, but there, so there is definitely like a newer version of it um, that looks like it must have been created for whatever re-releases that they do of it mm -hmm. that she definitely has red hair in, but it's, but I can't tell if that's just because of the way that they have styled it. Cause it's very black and red and like this tan color. Mm -hmm. um, but which features like her face above a um, newspaper that says Nancy Drew reporter. And then like her and Ted down at the bottom listening on, I guess some, something, some kind of okay. wire speaker or something. But then there's also another one that says a first national picture. And it's like an image or a still from the movie that's been like colorized. And it's just says Nancy reporter at the bottom and it's them. It's her and Ted and like a bad guy holding a gun at them. And her hair has definitely been colored to look red. Okay. Um, it's just hard to know where that comes cool. from. Hold on. It's got something down at the bottom. I wonder if I can see it. It's the one that's on Amazon. So okay. you can watch Nancy Drew Reporter on Amazon Prime for free. Mm -hmm. I just can't zoom in to see what it says at the bottom. So I don't know where that where that picture came from or when that was created. But then there's also, and this seems to be more original to me, the Nancy Drew Reporter. It says Nancy Drew Reporter. It's got like a blue background and it's got a Nancy in like a little circle in the bottom and like a Ted in a weird yellow tint standing next to her. But she's definitely blonde in that one. So hmm. I don't know. Maybe the red the redhead thing was a later edition. It's interesting. It is interesting. Again, I don't know why I'm so obsessed with that. That's <laughs> okay. I just have this burning topic. Yeah. Why is Nancy Drew's hair color so important? I guess maybe it just must be because of like all of the social. I mean, there's like a lot of conception about being blonde mm -hmm. um, and also being redheaded, you know, like there's, mm -hmm. there's two very like, it seemed to be very important. Like people attribute a lot to blondes. People attribute a lot to redheads. Like blondes right. are you know, stereotypically supposed to be dumb. And so there feels like there could be a lot of power and Nancy like reclaiming that. Mm -hmm. But then also like, you know, redheads are supposedly supposed to be spitfires, right? More <laughs> feisty in some way, which is silly. Mm -hmm. But, and so, you know, it could also make sense as to why Nancy would be more redheaded. So right. I don't know. I don't know. There's some strawberry blonde in the middle of both. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Right. What Do would you rate? Yeah. Rating? Yeah. Um, I'm going to give it a four and a half. Mm. I would give it a five just because Lark's Berlin was a five for me, but it does lose half a flashlight for no best George or Helen. Yeah, I agree. Totally. Mm -hmm. I would give it, I would also go to four, but yeah, I would probably, I'd want to give it a five just because of how entertaining it was. Yeah. It's really fun to watch, but yeah, it was, it was sad that Nancy didn't get to be more, get to be smarter, get to be more yeah. of a detective instead of, it just seemed like she was kind of playing it being one, Mary. which was disappointing. So yeah, four out of five flashlights for me mm -hmm. too. Hopefully in the future we will cover the other movies and we'll see maybe some progression. On yeah. That, yeah. We'll see. yeah. So. Speaking of our, our next, our future episodes. I'm so excited to tell you this. <laughs> Let's jump in then. Go ahead. Yeah, we are going to be moving on from our Nancy Drew mysteries to the Nancy Drew files. And we are going to be reading next. Stay tuned for danger. Woohoo! Oh, I'm so pumped. I love, 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 love the Nancy Drew files. And I am so excited to reread them because I haven't reread them in years. Um, and so, yeah, really excited to do that and talk about it with you. Yay. I'm excited to read them for the first time. I've never read any of the files. Um, of course, I've played Stay Tuned for Danger, the game, but I'm excited. Yeah, this should be good. Thank you for listening to Regular Nancy Drew. Email us at regularnancydrew at gmail.com. If you liked this episode, make sure to rate, review, and subscribe. 
You can also follow us on Instagram at regular Nancy Drew and Twitter at regular ND. You can also support us on Patreon. Patrons at the $1 level receive early access to each episode as well as weekly bonus content. And to all you regular Drews out there, thanks for listening. It was like a tongue twister. Bonita, 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 Bonita. It's like, say, how fast can you say Bonita? <laughs> Banana, Bonita. <laughs> Bonita, Bito, Fofita. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Hello, regular Drews. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Today we have a special episode. We are. Well, uh, <laughs> we'll start over. That was a weird intro. We'll start over. <laughs>